Hello there. Welcome to Fundamentals of Biology, where today we're going to be talking about thermoregulation. So by the end of this session, you should be able to explain the role of thermoregulation in homeostasis, describe the mechanism of negative feedback, discuss with examples the differences between endotherms and ectotherms, and then list some of the key adaptations for thermoregulation in animals. Organisms use homeostasis to maintain a steady state or internal balance regardless of the external environment. And in the last session, we looked at osmoregulation, which is where animals will regulate their water and solute concentrations of their fluids and cells. But homeostasis also incorporates a lot of other aspects. So in humans, body temperature, which is what we're going to be talking about in this session, osmolarity that we covered in the previous session, but also blood pH, hormone levels, calcium, glucose concentrations are all examples of things that are maintained at a constant level or within an optimal range. And it's really important for organisms to maintain these aspects within a tolerable range to keep their bodies functioning properly. When we come to temperature specifically, we can use this diagram that shows a home central heating system. And it also shows the, the main mechanism that maintains homeostasis, which is negative feedback. So the dynamic equilibrium of homeostasis, so things it's constantly changing, this is maintained by negative feedback. So let's investigate this diagram of the home central heating system. So if you have a central heating system, it will come with a thermostat and you will set that thermostat to the optimal temperature that you want your room at. So typical sort of room temperature will be about 20 degrees Celsius. So you set your thermo uh, thermostat to 20 degrees Celsius. If the room starts to warm up, it goes above that set point that will be detected and it will trigger a response to turn the radiators off or to turn the heating off. That will bring the room temperature back down and eventually you likely to drop below the set point. So that will be detected. The room is getting too cold. That will trigger a response to turn the heaters back on and that will in turn increase the room temperature and then it will keep rising till it gets above the set point, making the rooms too hot. That will turn the heater off the room temperature decreases, it drops below the set point. So you can see how we're making these fine adjustments all the time to, to keep the room within a tolerable range or close to this set point. So when you set your thermostat to 20 degrees Celsius, that will be your set point, but it will typically work on a tolerable range. So once the room temperature, say, gets above 21 degrees Celsius, that will trigger the response of turning the radiators off. If the room drops to 19 degrees Celsius, that will trigger the response of turning the heater on. So this is what we refer to as negative feedback because the stimulus, in this case, the room getting too hot, triggers a response that counteracts the stimulus. So the room gets too hot, the heater turns off, that cools the room. The, the room gets too cold, that triggers a response to turn the heater on, which will warm the room. So it's negative feedback. An example of positive feedback in animals would be nursing. So suckling by an infant produces more milk. More milk produces more suckling. And more suckling in turn produces more milk, more milk, more suckling. So there you have a positive feedback loop or positive feedback response where the stimulus triggers more of the reaction that triggers in turn more of the stimulus. So you've got positive feedback there. But with homeostasis, we are typically relying on negative feedback, feedback where the stimulus triggers a response that counteracts the stimulus. When it comes to animals regulating their internal temperature, Again, it's through this process of negative feedback, but it's a very involved process because animals are, have a whole wide range of, of activity levels. They live in different environments. 
and the way in which they thermoregulate will be determined by a number of factors and they involve form, function and behaviour. So thermoregulation is the process by which animals maintain an internal temperature within a tolerable range. And we know why this is important. And it goes back to the sessions that we did where we looked at biological molecules, specifically proteins and enzymes. We know that proteins and enzymes have a tolerable range. Um, enzymes have an optimal temperature at which they work at their best or their most effective. And movement away from that temperature range will have a, have a really big impact on how well those enzymes function and how well those proteins maintain their optimal shape. So it's really important that animals maintain their temperature within this tolerable range. Endothermic animals generate heat by metabolism. So they are generating their heat above, typically above ambient temperature through the process of metabolism or through that process of chemical reactions, most notably cellular respiration. Classic examples of endotherms are birds and mammals, but we also find some other examples in, in certain fish and certain reptiles. Ectothermic animals gain heat from external sources, so they aren't relying on heat generation through their metabolism to maintain their temperature often above ambient. Instead, their temperature will be determined by external sources. Examples of ectotherms are most invertebrates. So there are some examples that lean more towards endothermy. So examples such as some bees and some moths as examples. Um, most fishes, uh, again, there are some examples that lean more towards endothermy. So examples would be things like bluefin tuna. Some of the sharks, like great white sharks, are able to maintain temperature above um, ambient. Amphibians and reptiles are all examples of animals that are typically ectothermic. Now, these might be new terms to you, um, as traditionally these animals would be referred to as warm-blooded and cold-blooded. But I wanted to explain a little bit about why those terms are not really scientifically accurate. So typically as, as zoologists, as biologists, we prefer to use the terms endothermic and ectothermic as it is, it's much more accurate. But traditionally, warm-blooded animals are what we call endotherms and, and cold-blooded animals would be ectotherms. But we need to take into consideration a number of factors that enable us to see why those two terms aren't really accurate. So if we take endotherms, for instance, well, traditionally, like I said, we would think of those as warm-blooded animals but they're not all that's not always the case if you look at something like a grizzly bear that will undergo torpor or hibernation or certain ground squirrels that undergo hibernation well during the winter periods their t their body temperature can drop just above freezing they can drop dramatically into the lower single figures of degrees celsius so you wouldn't be able to class them as being warm-blooded at that time. And cold-blooded animals, well, we're looking at ectotherms there. If you look at some reptiles, for instance, so we've got a lizard down here that's basking in the sun. Well, at times their body temperature will be warmer than ours as an endotherm. So you couldn't really class them as ecto, uh, sorry, as cold-blooded animals when their body temperature is, is warmer than a warm-blooded animal. So it's not particularly accurate the way that we do that we we use those terms and we can also introduce a couple of other terms which are poikilotherm and homeotherm so a poikilotherm is an animal whose internal temperature varies considerably and the opposite to that is a homeotherm which is an animal whose internal temperature stays at a constant level so traditionally people would often think that a cold-blooded animal would be a poikilotherm, so their body temperature will change dramatically during the day. And whereas a warm-blooded animal is more likely to be a homeotherm with a constant internal temperature. 
But there are, again, there are reasons or examples where this is not the case. So we're much better off using the terms endotherm and ectotherm. So let me give you a couple of examples here. A pachylotherm, an animal whose internal temperature varies considerably. Well, we talked just now about the example of the grizzly bear or a ground squirrel that undergoes torpor or hibernation. Their body temperature during hibernation will drop considerably than what it is when it's wake, awake and, and living life normally during, say, the spring and summer months. So they would be classed as a poikilotherm. Their body temperature will vary greatly during the year. As humans, we would be endothermic, but we would also be homeotherm, so our body temperature is fairly stable. That grizzly bear, though, would be endothermic, so they're still generating heat by metabolism, but they would also be poikilothermic. If we take this lizard down here, that is definitely an ectotherm, so it's gaining heat from external sources, but it's not a homeotherm, it's a poikilotherm because its body temperature will vary greatly during the day. So you might think, well, okay, so all ectotherms or poikilotherms then. But that isn't the case. If you take something like a clownfish, so we're all familiar with Nemo, um, a clownfish is a ectotherm, so its body temperature or it's gaining heat from external sources but it lives in the tropical oceans where the temperatures are incredibly stable. So traditionally or typically the, the average temperature of a, a coral reef where you'll find common clownfish would be about 25 to 26 degrees Celsius, around that mark anyway. But it's very, very consistent all year round. So their body temperature will stay at a fairly constant level. So they are ectotherms, but they are also homeotherms. So it's really important for us as biologists and as zoologists to incorporate this, this more accurate terminology into our language when we're referring to animals and thermoregulation. Okay, so the, the terms warm-blooded and cold-blooded are just a bit too vague and they lack the accuracy required. So now that we know what thermoregulation is, and we know about endotherms and ectotherms and bochylotherms and homeotherms, it helps to actually have a little bit of an understanding of how animals actually exchange heat with the environment. So organisms exchange heat by four physical processes, and these are conduction, convection, radiation, and evaporation. And these are all really nicely demonstrated on the diagram that we can see here. So let's go through each one and talk a little bit about how it how it works. So let's start up here with radiation. So anything that has mass that is above absolute zero will radiate some kind of heat or some level of heat. So the biggest thing that we're aware of uh, in terms of our lives that radiates heat is the sun. So that radiates a huge amount of heat. And you can see here that we've got this reptile sitting on its rock and it is gaining heat through radiation from the sun. But you notice here that you've got another little arrow coming off here. This is also, this animal is also losing some heat through radiation. If we move down to this next one, we can see convection. And convection is the exchange of heat through, typically through liquid and gases. So air and water, essentially. So in, in this case, you can see that the air is blowing over the reptile. Um, and in this case, depending on whether the air temperature is cooler or warmer than the body of the animal, will determine whether it is gonna gain heat through convection or lose heat through convection. So heat will typically move from high to low, so from warm to cold. So we can see here with the, the air currents moving over the animal, it will lose heat through convection. If the air temperature was warmer than the animal, then it would gain heat through convection. And you would have all experienced this probably at some point in your life. If you've jumped in the sea in the UK, even on the nice hot sunny day, well, the sea temperature probably isn't much more above sort of 16 degrees Celsius. And your body temperature is a nice balmy 37 degrees Celsius. If you don't have a wetsuit or a dry suit on and you're just going in a, in a, um, a swimsuit, well, you are instantly going to start losing heat through convection.
and you will lose a lot of heat through convection because heat transmits through water much, much more effectively than it does through air. Similarly, if you've ever jumped in a, a really hot bath and you get out of that bath after 20 minutes, half an hour or something, you'll, you can be bright red and, and sweating almost because you've gained heat through convection through the really hot water in the bath. Okay, so convection is the transfer of heat typically through um, air and water. Moving along to the next one, we have conduction. And conduction is the transfer of heat between solid objects, essentially. So you can imagine this rock gaining heat through radiation. So the rock is warming up in the sun. And then the reptile comes and sits on top of the rock. And it is then absorbing that heat. It's gaining that heat through conduction. And again, the, the transfer of heat will typically go from high to low. So if this rock wasn't warmed by radiation, if this rock was cooler than the body temperature of the animal, then it would lose heat through conduction. The next one here is evaporation. So evaporation is a heat loss mechanism. So you're not going to gain heat through evaporation. You can only lose heat through evaporation. And we'll talk more about this later on because it is a very important and very effective way for animals to regulate their body temperature, that you can, you can lose heat very effectively through evaporation. For evaporation to occur though, you need water or you need liquid on the surface typically. So what's going to happen here is the, the water on the mucous membranes of the animal, so the eye, the lining of the mouth, the nose, so anywhere where you have a mucous membrane that has moisture on it, has water on it, as the, the body temperature increases, it will start to warm up the molecules of that water. And we know that, that heat is a measure of kinetic energy. So as the, the body temperature rises, the water molecules will absorb that heat. Those water molecules start moving faster and faster. And eventually they're moving so quickly that they start banging into each other. And then they will basically leap forward. They will remove themselves from that water turning from liquid water into water vapor. And that transfer or that movement or the change from liquid water to water vapor will also take heat away with it. So by evaporating water, by the water actually leaving the, the surface and turning into water vapor, that will take heat with it. So it is a, a very effective way of reducing heat, but it comes at a cost. And that cost is you will also lose water when you, when you undergo evaporation. So you will cool down, but you will lose water. So for a desert animal such as this reptile, that can be a very, very serious thing to consider or a very serious thing that needs managing. It's about balancing heat loss through evaporation, but ensuring that you don't lose too much water. Because again, in the previous session, we talked about osmoregulation. So animals need to balance their water content. Okay, so those are the four mechanisms or the four physical processes of heat exchange that animals are constantly working with. Radiation, so you can gain and lose heat through radiation. You can gain and lose heat through convection. Same with conduction. And you can lose heat through evaporation. Next, we need to move on to actually look at the some of the adaptations that animals have to help them thermoregulate. So I'm going to list these and then we'll investigate each one in more detail. So the first one is insulation. Then we have circulatory adaptations, cooling by evaporative heat loss, behavioral responses, and adjusting metabolic heat production. So these are the, the five general adaptations that help animals thermoregulate. And we're going to go through and look at each one of these in a bit more detail, and I'll give you some examples of species as we work through. The first adaptation we'll talk about is insulation. And this is a big component of the integumentary system, which is an animal skin and skin derivatives. So this will involve hair, nails, scales, feathers, that kind of thing. And here we can see a diagram of the mammalian integument or the, the mammalian integumentary system, which is essentially our skin and hair. And we can see 
that our skin is made up of three main layers. So we have the epidermis on the outside. It's made up of this stratified squamous epithelial. And then below that, we have the dermis. And inside the dermis here, you can see all kinds of things like the muscles. We can see the, uh, the hair follicles and the oil glands and the sweat glands. We have lots of nerves in there as well. Below the dermis, we have the hypodermis, which is largely composed of adipose tissue or fat tissue. So this is the really important insulation layer that we can see here. And insulation is really important because it helps to reduce the conduction of heat between the body and the external environment. So if we move on to the next slide and we can see this walrus here. So this walrus is living in the Arctic where temperatures are consistently below freezing. You have freezing wind temperature. You've got very cold water that it lives in as well. This walrus would not be able to live in this environment without a thick blubber layer or a thick insulation layer. So we can just sort of look at the walrus sitting on the ice here. So you can see it's probably just hauled itself out of this hole. So it's pulled itself out of the water. So its body surface is likely to be wet or it was recently. So it's exchanging heat with the environment through evaporation from its wet skin, through convection, through the, the cold air blowing over it. It's exchanging or losing heat potentially through conduction by sitting on the cold ice. And it's not going to be gaining much heat through um, radiation because the, the sun at this point will be sort of very weak and it, it can, can lose heat through radiation as well. So it's really important that it's able to reduce the amount of heat loss, namely through conduction, convection, um, and also evaporation to some degree. So this thick blubber layer, this thick fat layer, is what enables it to live in this harsh environment um, without losing heat. So insulation is a major thermoregulatory adaptation in mammals and birds. Skin, feathers, fur and blubber will help to reduce heat flow between an animal and its environment. So obviously we're looking at the, the walrus here, but if you were a bird and you're covered in feathers, that will also go a long way to helping to insulate your body. If we go back to the previous slide, where we look at the diagram of the integument, you can see the, the hair coming out of the, the skin here. Well, we're, you're probably all familiar with goosebumps. That is a, a vestigial reaction. So it's something that's left over that doesn't really serve much purpose for us anymore. That when we, we get cold, you can see down here, if we look at the, the hair follicle, we can see that it's surrounded by nerves and also muscles. So what will happen is the hairs will become erect. They will stand up and that will trap a layer of air in close to our body to help reduce heat exchange with the environment. So that can help to trap a layer of air there to help um, reduce, particularly help to reduce heat loss when we're cold. Now, obviously, as humans, we're, we're not particularly her suit anymore. We're not, we're not covered in, in thick hair like our ancestors, uh, chimpanzees, for instance. Um, but we do still see this reaction in a lot of other animals. You'll see birds do it particularly on a cold day, they will fluff up their feathers um, and trap that layer of air close to their body to reduce heat loss. The next adaptation is circulatory adaptations. The regulation of blood flow near the body surface significantly affects thermoregulation. So always keep in mind as we're going through these, keep those four processes of heat exchange so radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation. Keep those in mind, and they can help you to understand these adaptations. So regulation of blood flow near the body surface significantly affects thermoregulation. Many endotherms and some ectotherms can alter or adjust the amount of blood flowing between the body core and the skin. So we have vasodilation. This is where blood flow to the skin increases, facilitating heat loss. So you can imagine on a really hot day or at a time where you're doing lots of exercise, 
So we can break that down. When you do exercise, you are relying on muscle contractions. Muscle contractions require ATP. ATP production is carried out through cellular respiration and cellular respiration generates a lot of heat. So we, um, when you're exercising, you're, you're warming up your body. And one of the ways in which the body will combat this is to vasodilate. It will increase the flow of blood to the surface of the skin and that will enable the body to lose heat through radiation, through convection and through evaporation. And this is why when you get very, very warm, you will often have a, a more reddish glow to you. Your skin will look pink or red um, because you've increased the flow of blood to the skin. On a cold day, the opposite happens. So we undergo something called vasoconstriction. And this is where the blood vessel, so you can see on the diagram here, this is a dilated artery. So you can see how the diameter of it is increased to, to increase the flow of blood. Here we can see a normal artery. And here we can see a constricted artery. So it's reducing the amount of blood flowing through it. So vasoconstriction reduces blood flow to the skin. And this will reduce the amount of heat that we lose through convection, radiation, and evaporation specifically. So it helps to keep that heat within the core of the body. So these are quite simple circulatory adaptations that a lot of animals use. And the body is constantly making minute adjustments to this um, to, to regulate the amount of blood that's flowing to the surface of the skin to help regulate our internal temperature. We can get slightly more intricate circulatory adaptations though, such as countercurrent heat exchangers. And countercurrent heat exchangers, as an example, are how many birds, so gulls and penguins, for instance, uh, some geese, it's how they're able to live on ice and in cold water without their feet freezing. And they do this through an arrangement of blood vessels that enables them to maintain a warm core regardless of the fact that their feet may be in contact with very very cold surfaces so the arrangement of blood vessels in many marine mammals and birds allows for countercurrent exchange so how does it work well countercurrent heat exchangers transfer heat between blood flowing in opposite directions and we'll look at a diagram on the next slide but countercurrent heat exchangers are an important mechanism for reducing heat loss. And some bony fish and sharks will also use countercurrent heat exchangers to maintain a body temperature up to 10 degrees warmer, 10 degrees Celsius warmer than the water in which they're living. So things like great white sharks, bluefin tuna are good examples of this. This will enable their muscles to work more effectively, which is important as a predatory animal means that you're, you're able to swim harder and faster after potential prey. And you're also able to move into cooler waters to find food. So how do these countercurrent heat exchangers work? Well, let's have a look at the Canada goose here. So as I said, it, the, these, these animals may spend a lot of time walking on very cold ground and snow and ice, and also in very, very cold water. Their body is insulated with fat and feathers. So that isn't a problem. They're able to insulate the, the, their body to, to reduce heat loss. But the legs and the feet are not insulated. So how do they not freeze? And how do they not keep losing heat through this part of the body and then sending really cold blood back to the body? Because that itself would cause very, very serious problems. You can imagine that you've got an, um, the body temperature of this animal is similar, going to be similar to our own. So I think it's about 38 degrees Celsius for the Canada goose, maybe a little bit higher. So you can imagine that this warm blood gets pumped down into the legs and the feet. And as soon as it hits these uninsulated areas, it's going to start losing heat. It's going to start losing heat through radiation, convection, evaporation, all of those things. Blood temperature will drop very, very low, and then it could get pumped back into the body. And that could cause two potential issues. One, the animal could die through thermal shock. If you're pumping five degrees Celsius blood into a body temperature, into a body that's at 37, 38 or more degrees Celsius, 
But if it didn't die, if the animal didn't die, it then needs to invest energy to warm that blood back up, to bring it back up to body temperature. How does it warm it up? Well, through metabolism. What does it need for metabolism? Well, it needs oxygen, but it also needs food. So if you were going to do that, if the animal was going to do that, it would need to consume more food. And food can sometimes be hard to come by. So instead, what they've done is evolved this countercurrent heat exchange system. So what we can see here is a nice simplified diagram. So here we can see blood moving down the artery as it moves down into the legs and the feet. And then you can, so arteries, remember, carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood to the heart. So the arterial blood is nice and warm and it instantly will start losing that heat to the environment. But what we can see here is that the veins that return blood back to the body, back towards the heart, are in close proximity to the arteries. So in reality, they actually sort of wind around and they wrap around the arteries. So as the warm arterial blood starts losing its heat, it's not just losing it randomly to the environment. It's actually going into the blood in the veins, warming it back up. So by the time the blood reaches the body again, it's almost back up to normal body temperature. So in this way, venual blood, when it gets back to the body, is almost at the normal body temperature. It hasn't lost that heat. So this is the way in which these animals are able to have uninsulated legs and feet, but not lose lots and lots of heat to the environment. It's countercurrent exchanges. We see the same thing in the extremities of certain marine mammals like this bottlenose dolphin here you can see it in the flipper and in the dorsal fin in the caudal fin it will be the same and interestingly with with a lot of marine mammals we find countercurrent heat exchangers used for a different purpose and in the opposite direction and by that i mean instead of helping to keep blood warm they help to keep an area cooler so if you look at a, a bottlenose dolphin like this, let's assume that this is a male bottlenose dolphin, there's one important difference that we see here that we don't see with us, for instance, and that is testes. So with, with male humans, we have external testes, and that is important because for proper sperm production, our testes need to be at slightly cooler temperature than the rest of our body. So we have to have external testes to enable this. But if you are a bottlenose dolphin, evolution has shaped you to be as streamlined as possible, to reduce drag, to reduce the friction in the water, to make you a very fast swimmer, um, reducing drag and therefore reducing the amount of energy required for you to swim. So if this bottlenose dolphin was to have external testicles or external testes, um, that would reduce its hydrodynamic profile. Dolphins and, and other marine mammals have evolved to have internal testes. The problem there is their testes then will be at body temperature, which is a bit too warm for proper sperm production. So instead we find in marine mammals that they rely on countercurrent heat exchanges, both males and females rely on heat exchanges to keep the testes and the ovaries um, at a slightly cooler temperature. So they're actually taking heat away from those areas. Okay, so we can see there's some examples of circulatory adaptation so we've got the basics like vasoconstriction and vasodilation but then we also get these counter current heat exchangers often help animals live extreme lives the next important adaptation is cooling by evaporative heat loss i've kind of talked about this already um, a little bit but let's look at it in a bit more detail so many types of animals lose heat through evaporation of water in sweat so evaporation is the, the, the main reason in which we sweat. So we sweat, we cover the surface of our skin in water. That water will then evaporate, taking heat away from the body. But as I mentioned earlier, it does come with a problem. Um, and that is, it doesn't just take heat away from the body, it also removes water from the body. So it's very important when animals rely on evaporative heat loss um, that they have access so if, if you're keeping pets for instance so dogs are a good example that rely heavily on evaporative heat loss from their mouth and their tongue in particular um, evaporation only works when the surf the evaporative surface is wet 
So it's very important that, that animals such as dogs have access to plenty of fresh drinking water uh, so they can keep the, the surface of their mouth wet to help them lose, um, lose heat through evaporation. So I've just mentioned the dogs. Panting increases the cooling effect in many mammals, but also birds. So you'll quite often see birds also panting. So they open their mouth and sort of stick out their tongue a little bit. Um, always looks a bit strange to me that, but, um, but they, they use it as a, an effective means for heat loss. So we've talked about sweating, uh, but also bathing will moisten the skin. So any way that you can moisten the skin uh, and then rely on that moisture evaporating away will help to reduce heat. So it will help to cool an animal down. It's why you'll often see on a hot day, animals will head for water, not just to drink um, and to keep their, their mouth moist, but also to, to bathe in it, to make that whole surface wet. Because when you do that, you turn your entire body surface into a, an evaporative heat loss surface. Evaporation is a very, very effective heat loss mechanism. But as previously mentioned as well, animals have to be careful with evaporation. You can, it can be too effective and you can lose too much water. And we can see here with this kangaroo, kangaroos have a, a very famous behavior when it comes to, obviously they're, they're experts at living in very hot environments, and dry environments as well. And you can see what this kangaroo is doing here is it's licking its forearms. So they don't have any fur on their forearms and they are highly vascularized. So they have a lot of blood flowing to the surface of the skin. And what they will do is lick their forearms and they'll often sort of find shade at the hottest part of the day. They will lick their forearms and they will sort of sit there with their arms out and they will be relying on the evaporation of the saliva from the skin to help cool them down. And evaporation will work more effectively or less effectively depending on ambient conditions as well, most notably things like humidity. So you can go back to things like concentration gradients that we've talked about before. Uh, if you are in a very, very dry environment and the air is very dry with very low humidity, you are much more likely to lose heat uh, effectively through evaporation than if you are in an area with very, very high humidity, where there's already a lot of moisture in the air. If any of you have ever been to a tropical rainforest, you might have experienced this, where you have really high humidity. You can even get this in the UK, around coastal areas where you have high humidity on a hot summer's day. When you start to warm up, your body starts producing sweat but that sweat doesn't evaporate because the air is already full of moisture. It's already really high humidity. So instead of actually helping to cool you down, the sweat can actually cling to you and it acts as another insulation layer. So it can actually start to warm you up even more. So it can be quite dangerous. Okay, so evaporation is, is really, really important, but it does come with certain risks. The next one that to look at is behavioral responses. And these can be very, very small things to quite large um, responses. And we use these as humans. We use behavioral responses all the time um, to help us thermoregulate. So both endotherms and ectotherms use behavioral responses to control body temperature. So some terrestrial invertebrates, such as this dragonfly here, will have postures that minimize or maximize absorption of solar heat. So when they're trying to warm up, most notably first thing in the morning when the, 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 the air temperature hasn't warmed up particularly, but they want to get busy. They want to get active flying around and finding food or finding a mate. What they will do is often orientate themselves towards the sun to maximize the, the surface of the body that is exposed to the sun so they can absorb more heat through, if, uh, through radiation. During the hottest parts of the day, they will often orientate the, the, the smallest or lowest part of their profile towards the sun to reduce the amount of heat they gain through radiation. So they, they will use these, um, these sort of behavioral postures to help either increase heat absorption or reduce heat absorption. And we, as I said, we do this all the time as humans. We have lots of subtle behavioral responses, basic things that we do all the time that we don't think about. So if you get cold, you put on a jumper or you might sit closer to a heat source or you might cuddle with somebody. Um, if you get too hot, 
Um, you might take off a layer of clothing, you open a window, you might go and stand in some shade to get away from direct sunlight. There are lots of different subtle behavioural responses that we, we constantly do. And all animals will typically do these kinds of things. Okay, so you've got the big ones, I guess, like certain reptiles, they will move between shade and sunlight. So basking and then moving into the shade. Um, but then also just very, very subtle ones. Another sort of really important example would be things like um, emperor penguins. They're, they're a classic example of this, where their huddling behaviour helps them to, to survive winters in Antarctica, uh, where otherwise, as if they were just a lone individual, they wouldn't be able to survive. But they can huddle um, and then they sort of rotate around. So they, they will spend a bit of time at the centre of the huddle where they're nice and warm and out of the wind and then they will have to eventually have their own time where they're on the periphery or on the outskirts of the huddle and then they're constantly rotating that way we see similar things with some other um, insects like bees for instance bees use behavioral responses when they're too warm they've been known to bring water back to the hive that helps them to use evaporation to reduce heat when they get too cool in the hive, they will, they've been shown to huddle. Once you start to realize this and you start to think about this, you start to see lots of very subtle behaviors in animals when you observe them, particularly in extreme times, so the height of summer and in the winter. You'll see lots of specific little behaviors that animals do that are tied to thermoregulation. So it's something for you to keep an eye on um, when you're observing animals in, in the future. So the last adaptation to look at is adjusting metabolic heat production. So metabolic heat production is, we're just referring largely to cellular respiration. So the production of ATP through cellular respiration generates an awful lot of heat. And some animals can regulate their body temperature by adjusting their rate of metabolic heat production. So we, we know as, as endotherms, so as mammals, we are endotherms, we rely heavily on this to maintain a nice warm temperature of about 36 to 38 degrees Celsius, regardless of the external temperature. But we can increase or decrease our metabolic heat production to either help warm up or um, in some cases, um, other animals will also do this to warm up as well. So ectotherms, for instance, that we wouldn't traditionally relate with this kind of behavior. So heat production is increased by muscle activity such as moving or shivering. And again, this is something that you would, you would notice in yourself. If you're outside on a cold day, it's much more comfortable if you keep moving. And that can just sort of be just you know, jumping or running on the spot or walking on the spot, keeping your arms sort of moving around your body. You can flap your arms a little bit. All of that is by keeping moving, you are relying on muscle contractions. Muscle contractions need ATP. ATP is produced through cellular respiration and that generates heat. And what we can see with this python here is she has actually wrapped her body around her clutch of eggs and she will rely on shivering to increase her body temperature, which will in turn increase the temperature inside the coil uh, and inside the eggs, which will speed up the development time of those eggs. So we can see that adjusting metabolic heat production is not just an endothermic um, trait. We can also see it in some ectotherms. We also see it in some insects. I mentioned with bees earlier that they can huddle together in a hive and use muscle contractions or beating of their wings to help increase metabolic heat production and increase the temperature inside the hive. On this graph, we can actually see a hawk moth um, and we have two different lines here. We have the temperature of the thorax, which is this part of the animal, which contains its flight muscles. And here we can see it's the temperature of its abdomen. And on the, up the y-axis, we can see the temperature. And along the x-axis, we've got the time. For their flight muscles to work effectively, they need to be at a specific temperature, similar to our own body temperature, actually, sort of up here in, in the sort of mid to high 30 degrees Celsius. For that to happen, they need to do something called a pre-flight warm-up. So you can see here when the animal isn't flying, its body temperature is at about 23 to 24 degrees Celsius. Well, that isn't high enough for its flight muscles to work properly. 
So instead, what they will do is they will start a shivering process where they're contracting their flight muscles. So they don't necessarily have to flap their wings intensely. Um, some animals will do this, but they just need to start shivering, start contracting those flight muscles. And this is what we call the pre-flight warm-up. And you can see the temperature of the thorax increasing dramatically until the, the flight muscles are at the right temperature for them to work effectively. But you notice that the temperature of the abdomen does not increase anywhere near the same level. So we can see here another example of an ectotherm relying on adjusting its metabolic heat production to enable it to carry out a particular function. In this case, it's flying. So those were the five main adaptations that animals have to help with thermoregulation. But we can also find some slightly larger scale um, adaptations specifically for animals that either live in extreme environments or particularly for animals that live in temperate parts of the world. So those are, those are parts of the world that experience um, seasons or seasonal changes. And this includes something called acclimatization. So a classic example of acclimatization will be where birds and mammals vary their insulation to acclimatize to seasonal changes in temperature. So we know of this as molting. And we'll often see this with um, animals sort of developing a, a thicker fur or feather layer in time for winter. And then during the spring months, they will start to shed this and start to develop a, a thinner, typically um, sort of lighter coat or feathers for the summer months where it's much warmer. And we can see that with this seal here that's molting its winter coat in time for summer. And then an, an extreme example here. So we've got an Antarctic ice fish here. Um, and these animals, when they are in sub-zero temperatures, they will actually produce antifreeze compounds and they will prevent ice crystals from forming in their cells and in their tissues. So they are actually, these animals are actually able to live in temperatures as low as minus two degrees Celsius, which is actually below the freezing temperature of blood and tissue. And this diagram just basically sums up some of the things that we've just been talking about in terms of our own thermoregulatory mechanisms. So right here in the middle, we can see homeostasis. So this is our optimal to internal temperature range of 36 to 38 degrees C. So as our body temperature increases, this will act as the stimulus that is detected by sensors throughout the body. This is processed by the brain. So by the thermostat of the brain or the body, which is called the hypothalamus, this will then activate cooling mechanisms. So it will trigger the production and release of sweat. That coupled with vasodilation, so the um, dilating of blood vessels, the, the increase of blood flow to the surface of the skin will help to increase the loss of heat through radiation, through convection, and in combination with the sweat through evaporation. This should be enough to bring our body temperature down along with some of our behavioral, um, behavioral responses as well, such as going to move in some shade, um, maybe cooling off through removing layers of clothing, or whatever it might be. This should be enough to bring our internal temperature back down. If our body temperature decreases, so that is the stimulus detected by sensors, that will trigger a response by the hypothalamus to trigger vasoconstriction, so reduce the amount of blood flowing to the surface of the skin. And then it will also likely trigger um, shivering, but also maybe movement as well. You may feel the urge to jump up and down or run on the spot, but it will also trigger um, shivering to generate heat production, which should be enough to bring our body temperature back up to within the optimal range again. So this is the basics of how thermoregulation works within us. Now that we've had a good look at thermoregulation, it's important to consider how this impacts the energy requirements of an animal and then also have a think about some of the other aspects of energy requirement. So as we can see here, energy requirements are related to animal size, activity, as well as the environment. And we call the process of energy flow through an animal bioenergetics.
So bioenergetics is the overall flow and transformation of energy in an animal. And it will determine how much food an animal needs. And it relates to an animal's size, its activity and its environment. Animals harvest chemical energy from their food. And the energy containing molecules in that food are used to make ATP, which powers cellular work. It's this that enables the animal to do the things that it does. After the needs of staying alive are met, so we're looking at providing energy for gas exchange to, to power the lungs, to power the circulatory system, to keep the nervous system functioning. Once all of those needs have been met, any remaining energy can be used in something called biosynthesis. And biosynthesis includes body growth and repair, as well as the synthesis of storage material such as fat. So when you have a surplus of energy, you can store it for later use. And also the production of gametes. First and foremost, an animal will meet the requirements of staying alive. So you have to keep the circulatory system going. You have to keep the nervous system functioning properly. Once those things have been met, only then will the animal start to put energy, any excess energy, into growth and repair, the production of fat, and also reproduction. So we often see in animals that are malnourished, that aren't receiving enough energy, that they tend to look in pretty poor condition. They're not growing properly. They aren't able to um, heal themselves or repair themselves properly. They aren't reproducing. So it's very, very important that we keep that in consideration as we go through. We can actually see that represented in this diagram. So at first glance, it doesn't look that pretty, but as we go through, we can follow the flow of energy through an animal system. So we start at the top here, which represents the organic molecules in our food. So they enter into the animal body. You go through the process of digestion. So that's the breaking down of the food and then absorbing the nutrients. This is a process that generates heat. So we lose some of the energy from that food as heat. We also end up with some waste products. Uh, so the undigestible portions of that food that so we lose some energy in the form of feces. The remaining energy can then be absorbed. So we end up with the nutrient molecules going into our body cells where they will feed into cellular respiration to generate ATP to, to power cellular work. And as we've talked about in this session, we know that that generates a lot of heat. The ATP will then go into cellular work, which itself will generate heat. So we can see that we lose a fair amount of the energy from our food as heat. Any other food or energy from our food that is left over will go over here into biosynthesis. So growth, repair, the, the synthesis of fat and also the production of gametes. And again, this process will generate some heat. And then these can then be broken down. Things like fat can be broken down and those nutrients can then be fed back into the system. Okay, but this is the path that energy will flow th um, first to meet the requirements of staying alive. Only once these have been met, can we put any excess energy over here into biosynthesis. So that's an important consideration to remember and it helps us to, to work out things like the nutrient requirements of animals, which can be particularly important when we're keeping animals in captivity. So how do we measure energy use? How do we quantify it? Well, we look at something called the metabolic rate, and this is the amount of energy an animal uses in a given unit of time. And there are a couple of main ways in which uh, scientists can measure this metabolic rate. One way is to measure the amount of oxygen or carbon dioxide produced. So that's what you can see in this photograph here. This animal has a, a, a face mask on and then it is on a treadmill. So the scientist is able to measure the oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide produced at different exercise levels. Another way that scientists will often measure this is to actually look at the amount of heat that is generated uh, by the animal. When it comes to the influences on metabolic rate, 
there are a number of things that we need to consider. So metabolic rates are affected by many factors besides whether an animal is an endotherm or an ectotherm. So for a given size of animal, typically an ectotherm will have a much lower metabolic rate than an endotherm because endotherms have to generate that heat through metabolism to maintain that warmer body temperature, regardless of the external temperature, our, our metabolic rates tend to be much higher in relation to a similarly sized ectotherm. But there are a lot of other factors that we need to consider. And some of these factors are the size of the animal, the age, the sex, the activity levels, um, and as well as the environment. All of these, th these things need to be considered. We also find some interesting relationships between animal size and metabolic rate. So one of the relationships you can see here is that metabolic rate per gram of animal is inversely related to body size among similar animals. So what this typically means is the larger an animal is, the lower its metabolic rate per gram of animal will be in comparison to smaller animals. And this relationship is not fully understood at the moment, but essentially what we do know is that the higher metabolic rate of smaller animals per gram leads to a higher oxygen delivery rate, a higher breathing rate, heart rate, and also a greater relative to body size blood volume compared with a larger animal. We can represent that relationship on this graph where at the y-axis here, we've got the something called the basal metabolic rate, which we'll, I'll explain in a second. So we're looking here at liter of oxygen per hour consumed per kilogram of animal. So that's its metabolic rate. And then we have the body mass in kilograms along the x-axis. And then we can see here with the shrew, which is the smallest animal on the graph, has the highest metabolic rate. And as we increase in body mass, so in parvus mouse, mouse, rat, cat, dog, sheep, human, horse, and elephant, we can see that as body mass increases, the basal metabolic rate actually decreases. We also see an interesting relationship between activity and metabolic rate. So activity will greatly affect the metabolic rate for endotherms and ectotherms. If you're gonna be more active, you're gonna have higher ATP requirements to power those muscle contractions. Uh, therefore, you're gonna need more food and you're gonna need more oxygen. Your rate of ATP production through respiration is gonna to need to increase. But the relationship is that in general, the maximum metabolic rate an animal can sustain is inversely related to the duration of the activity. So basically what that means, the harder you work, the shorter the period of time you can maintain that, le that high level of work for. So the examples here, the, the classic example here is something like the cheetah. So cheetahs are known obviously for their, their high speed um, chases to catch prey. But when you actually look at the, the way a cheetah uses its high speed, it only maintains its top speed for seconds at a time. And that is because it is reaching its maximum metabolic rate. So with this inverse relationship to the duration of the time the activity can be sustained, we find that the faster the cheetah runs, the shorter it can maintain that, that high speed for. So it will run very, very quickly for a few seconds, and then it will have to have this downtime afterwards to recover. Similar with Usain Bolt here. So obviously Usain Bolt, uh, so holds the world record for uh, 100 meters and the pace at which he runs that 100 meters is unsustainable at longer distances so you want uh, when he runs the the 200 meters the pace is slightly lower if he was to go on and run even longer distances say the 1500 meters or a marathon for instance the pace that he can maintain um, would be increase would get increasingly lower with each, uh, each longer distance that he runs. So we get this relationship between the maximum metabolic rate and the duration that that activity can be sustained. Once we start considering all of these relationships, we can start to provide or produce something called energy budgets for animals. And this is looking at how they partition 
the energy from their food into different activities. So different species use energy and materials in food in different ways, depending on their environment largely. So use of energy is partitioned to BMR, so that is the basal metabolic rate, which is the measure of the basal metabolic rate for endotherms and standard metabolic rate for ectotherms. Um, but basically both of them refer to the requirements of staying alive. So they're usually measured in an animal that is fasted, so it's not digesting food, it's under no stress, it's not exercising, it's at a comfortable temperature. So it is basically at a, at a zen place, if you like. It's not doing anything to raise its metabolic rate. So our energy budgets first goes to maintaining the requirements of staying alive. In this case, that's the BMR or the SMR, the basal metabolic rate or the standard metabolic rate. But we're assuming that an animal is getting plenty of food, so we can then start to partition energy towards activity, thermoregulation, growth, and then reproduction. So what happens with animals that cannot maintain their basal metabolic rate throughout the day or throughout periods of time in the year? Because as we know, not all animals will have access to the same amount of food or the required amount of food at all times of the day or even all times of the year particularly those animals that live in temperate seasonal parts of the world. So how do they deal with that? Well, they deal with it through something called torpor and energy conservation. So torpor is a physiological state in which activity is low and the metabolism decreases. So the animal will actually reduce its metabolic rate to greatly reduce the amount of food it needs to consume. Torpor enables animals to save energy while avoiding difficult and even dangerous conditions. So probably the most famous example of torpor is hibernation. And this is a long-term torpor that is an adaptation to winter cold and food scarcity. So we can see one of our native, um, in the UK, native species here, um, the dormouse. Um, actually in its hibernation state so quite a cute photo of that but there are animals all over the world that live in uh, temperate regions or temperate temperate areas of the world where they experience very cold winters where you might have a lot of snowfall where there just isn't any or enough food available for them to meet the requirements of staying alive so they have evolved to hibernate to lower their metabolic rate, lower their activity levels, and that will in turn see them through the winter, where then they can then emerge in the spring and summer, feed up, reproduce, and then they will then be able to go into hibernation again the following winter. And this diagram does a really good job of explaining why, or, or, or demonstrating, should I say, why this is important. So what we can see here, so this there's a, there's a bit of a complex diagram at first glance, but we'll break it down and hopefully it'll make a bit of sense then. So we're following here this little chap up here, which is a Belding's ground squirrel from North America. So it's from a temperate region where it experiences very, very cold winters. We'll, fo we'll focus first on this bottom part of the graph, forget about the top bit for now. And we can see at the y-axis here, we have temperature in degrees Celsius. So here's, we've got zero and then below freezing and then up to 35. Um, well, basically we're going up to about 37 degrees Celsius here. And then along the X axis here, we have the months of the year. So basically finishing off summer and then moving through winter and then finally into spring. What we can see here with the blue line, this blue line is the outside temperature so the air temperature outside the animal's burrow the red line is the temperature inside the squirrel's burrow so as you'd imagine the air temperature or the temperature outside the burrow following the blue line in summer it's nice and high so it gets to above 20 degrees celsius and then during the winter it drops to about minus 
12 to minus 13 degrees Celsius. Stays like that for a good few months. And then once you start getting into April, you start moving into spring, the temperature will start to come up again. The temperature inside the burrow, because the burrow will be insulated, doesn't get quite as low as that, but it still gets fairly low. So if we follow the red line, which is the burrow temperature, nice and high in the summer, and then in the winter, it gets down to just above freezing. So maybe one or two degrees Celsius, and then starts to warm up again in spring. The black line we can see here is the body temperature of the, the ground squirrel. When it's awake and it's active during the summer months, its body temperature is not too dissimilar to ours. So you can see here, it's about 37 degrees Celsius. And as an endotherm, it's maintaining that nice constant body temperature. Once it goes into winter, it will enter into hibernation. So you can see the body temperature drops to pretty much the same as the burrow temperature, or it stays just above the burrow temperature. At its lowest, you can see down here, the body temperature is way down into the single figures, maybe three or four degrees Celsius. But what you'll notice is that you've got lots of peaks and troughs here. So what happens is the animal will go into hibernation and then about every two weeks or so, it will arouse itself, so it wakes itself up. So it goes through these periods of arousal it will wake itself up and it will spend a short amount of time, um, maybe a, a few hours or up to a day, where it will spend that time feeding um, on any food that it's stored within its burrow. It will do some maintenance on its burrow, just sort of keep everything tidy. And then it will drop back into hibernation and then it will go through another period of arousal a couple of weeks later. And it will do that all the way through the winter, these periods of hibernation and arousal all the way through until spring when it can then wake up and emerge from its burrow and then go out and start feeding and reproducing again. So why is that important? How does that enable the animal to survive? Well, this is where we get to the top part of the, the diagram. So we're still following on the x-axis here. So this still follows the summer through to the winter and then into spring. But now on the y-axis here, we have the metabolic rate. We can see here, starting over on the far left, during the summer months, this is its metabolic rate here. And then we can see here what actually happens. Its metabolic rate during its periods of hibernation drop very, very low. It, it rises during its periods of arousal and then drops again. So you get these peaks and troughs all the way through. The top line here is the line or follows the what the metabolic rate would be if the animal were to stay awake all the way throughout the winter. So we can see here additional metabolism that would be necessary to stay active in the winter. And what you can see is the metabolic rate would increase dramatically. That means that food consumption would have to increase to meet the increased metabolic rate. And you are talking about now at a time of the year, so through the winter, when food availability is at its lowest. So this is, where we, this is why we see hibernation evolve in these animals, because they have an increased metabolic demand during the winter, and during the winter, there is little to no food available to meet the increased metabolic demand. So the only way that they can survive in that area is to go through these periods of hibernation, therefore greatly reducing their metabolic demand or metabolic rate and subsequently decreasing their food demands. So we can see that that's, that's essentially why we have hibernation. It's to avoid the extremely low temperatures, which can be damaging in themselves, but it's also to remove themselves or reduce the need to consume even more food at a time when food is least available. The opposite to hibernation, and one that is it's much less talked about, it's not quite as common as we see um, with hibernation, but that is estivation. And estivation is summer torpor. And this enables animals to survive long periods of high temperatures and scarce water supplies. So a classic example of an animal that does this, you can see down here, and it's the lungfish. So we see this in a number of fish species in Africa. So other catfish species will do this as well. 
And essentially what they will do is they'll spend the rainy season um, living in the river, doing their fishy things, feeding and reproducing and growing. But as the water level starts to recede within the river basin and you start to move towards the dry season, they will actually burrow themselves into the riverbank and then they will start to secrete a layer of mucus around them. So they basically make a sleeping bag of mucus and it's still it's permeable to gas. So they're able to breathe still, but it traps a layer of water within their um, within their, their mucus layer. So they're still able to breathe and then they will lower their metabolic rate and they will just stay there um, throughout the dry season. And then once the, the rainy season returns again, that will trigger them to wake up essentially and then they will break through their their mucus barrier and then they will go back into the river and live their normal life throughout the wet season where they grow and feed and reproduce again so aestivation is less talked about but it's essentially the same as hibernation uh, but it just it, it's for the summer for high temperatures rather than cold temperatures but we also see some animals that will actually go through daily torpor classic examples are hummingbirds and you also get um, another group of birds the chickadees um, that live up towards the the arctic circle where they experience cold temperatures up there but with hummingbirds it's more to do with the fact that they are very small they have an incredibly high metabolic rate to the point where they need to keep feeding almost consistently throughout the day and when they get to the evening where the temperature will often be a bit cooler their metabolic rate increases but they're not feeding during the night they will not have enough energy reserves to meet the increased metabolic demands. So they cope with this by going into torpor and they do this every evening. And some bats will actually do this as well. So the daily torpor is exhibited by many small mammals and birds and seems adapted to feeding patterns. So they're not um, during periods when they're not feeding, they will go into daily torpor where their metabolic rate drops, their body temperature will usually drop accordingly and then they will stay that stay that way until they wake and then they can go about their day and, and carry on feeding so torpor can be short term uh, so it can occur daily or it can be long term like hibernation and extivation okay so that feels like it was quite a long session we've covered quite a bit um, so you might need to just go over a few of those things again but hopefully you found that that interesting I think there's a a lot of useful topics that we've covered in there um, that can really influence how we look at and consider what animals are doing and why they're doing the things that they do. But as always, let's finish off by doing a quick recap quiz and see what you can remember. So I'll read the questions out. I'll give you five minutes to answer them and then we'll go through the answers together. So question number one, name the three layers of mammalian skin Number two, what are the four physical processes of heat exchange? Number three, it's too warm. What are the two main responses initiated by the hypothalamus? Number four, it's too cold. What are the two responses initiated by the hypothalamus? And then number five, what is the main benefit of long-term torpor? Okay, so I'll give you five minutes to answer those questions and then we'll go through the answers together. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you've had a chance to answer those. Let's go through the answers. So number one, name the three layers of mammalian skin. Well, they are the epidermis, the dermis and the hypodermis. As an extra question, which one of those is the fat layer that helps with insulation? Yep, it's the hypodermis. So hopefully you got that one right. Number two, what are the four physical processes of heat exchange? Well, they are radiation, convection, conduction, and evaporation. Number three, it's too warm. What are the two responses initiated by the hypothalamus? Well, it's vasodilation and sweating. So vasodilation to increase blood flow to the surface of the skin and then sweating to encourage or increase heat loss through evaporation. It's too cold. So number four, it's too cold. What are the two responses initiated? 
Well, the opposite. So we have vasoconstriction and then we have shivering. So the adjusting our metabolic heat production to generate heat. And then number five, what is the main benefit of long-term torpor? Well, it lowers metabolism during times of food or water scarcity and extreme temperatures. So it's all about lowering that metabolic rate and lowering the, the demands for food and water at a time when they are less available. Okay, so hopefully you did okay with those. But as always, um, don't worry too much at this stage. If you got didn't get them all right, you can always go back over things um, and have another look through. So that brings us to the end of this session then where hopefully you should now be able to explain the role of thermoregulation in homeostasis. You should be able to describe the mechanism of negative feedback. Discuss with examples the differences between endotherms and ectotherms. And also remember those other two terms, the pachylotherms and homeotherms that we also talked about. And then also list some key adaptations for thermoregulation. So we looked at the five main adaptations. And then we also finished off by talking briefly about bioenergetics um, as well as torpor. Anyway, hopefully that was useful um, and I'll see you in the next session. Thanks very much.